Welcome to Animology, a podcast about language, the animal-related words and expressions we use every day, and how these words shape and reflect our relationship with animals. I'm Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. I'm your host. You can find me at ColleenPatrickGaudreau.com and on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And be sure to subscribe to Animology at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying this free podcast called Animology, I just ask that you share it with others and leave ratings and reviews. We're having giveaways every week for really awesome prizes. So if you leave a rating and review, just take a screenshot, send it to us via the contact page at animologypodcast.com, and you'll be eligible to win one of those prizes. Supporting the podcast is the best way to keep it going. So please go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to leave a tip in the jar by becoming a monthly supporter. Today's episode is Old English Pigs and Old French Pork, the Linguistic Cleaving of Animals. You might remember from an earlier episode called The History of the English Language in 10 ish minutes, I said that the English language boasts one of the largest vocabularies, if not the largest vocabulary, with more than one million words recorded from the time of its Anglo-Saxon or Old English roots in the 5th century right up through today. It has proven to be a resilient, flexible language that has absorbed and borrowed and adopted tens of thousands of words from a number of sources. Our Germanic language at its core and influenced by Norse, Greek, Latin, and Celtic, English has mutated dramatically over these many centuries, shaped by warring cultures, invading tribes, and prolonged occupations, not to mention a little thing called Christianity and the literacy it brought and spread throughout Britain. After the Norman conquest of 1066, English was replaced for a time as the language of the ruling class by Anglo-Norman, a northern dialect of Old French. For centuries after Duke William II of Normandy, William the Conqueror, defeated King Harold and the English army at the Battle of Hastings, Anglo-Norman, this French varietal, was the language of the government, law, and culture, while Latin was the language of the church and scholarship. Old English continued to be spoken by the common people, those who worked the land rather than owned it, This carried on until about the end of the 14th century when English reasserted itself as the language of authority. But by that time, French had made its mark and a new language was forged, that which we call Middle English, the progenitor of our modern English. Roughly 10,000 new words entered the English language during the Norman occupation and assimilation, particularly those having to do with the beau monde, the world of fashionable society, the elite, the wealthy, the aristocratic. Words related to the arts, literature, music, and architecture. Hence, we have paint, dance, author, harmony, castle, tower, vault, frieze, and buttress. Words from French related to government, finance, and social class became a fixed part of the English vocabulary, such as, well, government and finance, along with verdict, indict, parliament, lease, tax, sovereign, duke, baron, count, serf, S-E-R-F, not as in surfing at the beach, uh, servant and peasant. Many words related to the military have French origins, armor, battle, army, platoon, brigade, colonel, as do those related to food and eating, including savor, salad, liquor, beef, veal, pork, mutton, and poultry. The effects of the linguistic class division between the country folk and the gentle folk are most apparent in the culinary realm, where words used by the aristocracy have French origins And words used by the commoners have Germanic origins. This is evident even today in the way we talk about certain animals, particularly those typically eaten by Westerners, with words rooted in Anglo-Saxon or Old English to indicate the living animals, and words rooted in Old French to indicate the slaughtered animal as flesh for consumption. So imagine a table of two columns. On the left, we have the Old English words for the living animal, cow, steer, bull, ox, and calf. 
And then imagine on the right column, we have the word from Old French to denote the slaughtered animal as flesh for consumption, beef. On the left column, we have pig, hog, swine, boar, and sow. All of these are Old English words. And on the right, we have from Old French, pork, that came into English as pork. On the left, we have the Old English words sheep, ram, ewe, and weather, W-E-T-H-E-R. And then on the right, we have from Old French, mutton. On the left, we have the Old English words deer, stag, buck, and doe. And on the right side, from Old French, we have the word that denotes the animal as flesh for consumption, venison. On the left, chicken, goose, duck, fowl, all Old English words for the living animals. And on the right, we have, from Old French, poultry to denote the flesh of these animals for human consumption. Now, all the words I just gave you for the living animals in Old English, I'm giving you the modern English names. Some of them have changed. Some of them are similar. Cow would have been coo in Old English. Steer would have been steor in Old English. Bull would have been bula. Ox would have been oxa. Calf would have been calf. Pig would have been either pick or fair. Hog would have been hog. Swine would have been sween, just a pronunciation change. Boar would have been bar. Sow would have been sugu. Sheep would have been sheop. Ram would have been rom, and so on. Now, the French-speaking nobility who ruled the kingdom from the 11th to the 14th centuries would not have had cause, or made cause, to interact with the living sheop, ku, and fer, the living sheep, cow, and pig, tended by the peasants. They would know these animals only once they were transformed into moton, boeuf, and pork, Norman French words that mutated into Middle English and subsequently Modern English into mutton, beef, and pork. This separate lexicon, one word for the living animal, one word for the slaughtered, became standardized over the centuries and is evident now in English speakers all around the world. Scottish author Sir Walter Scott famously depicts this medieval class and linguistic division in his historical novel, Ivanhoe. Published in 1820, the story centers on one of the remaining Saxon aristocratic families in 12th century England at the time when the nobility was overwhelmingly Norman. An exchange between the swineherd, the pig keeper, Gerth, and the jester Wamba sums up the feudal dynamic of the time. Like the domesticated animals he looks after, Gerth is a thrall, a slave to the Lord, whose chattel status is amplified by the iron collar he's forced to wear around his neck. Wamba, true to the literary trope to which he belongs, is the wise fool who uses wordplay to explain what is not readily apparent to others. Here's a quote. Truly, said Wamba, without stirring from the spot, I have consulted my legs upon this matter, and they're altogether of opinion that to carry my gay garments through these sloths would be an act of unfriendship to my sovereign person and royal wardrobe. Wherefore, Gerth, I advise thee to leave the herd to their destiny, which whether they meet with bands of traveling soldiers or of outlaws or of wandering pilgrims can be a little else than to be converted into Normans, before morning, to thy no small ease and comfort. The swine turned Normans to my comfort, quoth Gerth. Expound that to me, Wanda, for my brain is too dull, and my mind too vexed to read riddles. Why, how call you those grunting brutes running about on their four legs, demanded Wamba. Swine, fool, swine, said the herd. Every fool knows that. And swine is good Saxon, said the jester. But how call you the sow when she is flayed and drawn and quartered and hung up by the heels like a traitor? Pork, answered the swineherd. I'm very glad every fool knows that too, said Wamba. And pork, I think, is good Norman French. And so when the brute lives and is in the charge of a Saxon slave, she goes by her Saxon name, but becomes a Norman and is called pork when she's carried to the castle hall to feast among the nobles. What does thou think of this, friend Gerth? 
It is but too true doctrine, friend Wamba, however it got into thy fool's pate. And just a note, pate is a 14th century word meaning head. So however this got into thy fool's head. Nay, I can tell you more, said Wamba, in the same tone. There is old Alderman Ox continues to hold his epithet while he is under the charge of serfs and bondsmen such as thou, but becomes beef, a fiery French gallant, when he arrives before the worshipful jaws that are destined to consume him. Menir Calf, too, becomes Monsieur de Vaux in the like manner. He's Saxon when he requires tendance and takes a Norman name when he becomes a matter of enjoyment. By St. Dunstan, answered Gurth, thou speakest but sad truths. Little is left to us but the air we breathe, and that appears to have been reserved with much hesitation, solely for the purpose of enabling us to endure the tasks they lay upon our shoulders. The finest and the fattest is for their board, the loveliest is for their couch. So Gurth's commentary reflects the phenomenon that has been the case for centuries, that animal meat has long been a product of privilege and a symbol of affluence, affordable only to the wealthy and denied to, albeit raised and processed by the lower and working classes. Today, it's only because meat and animal products are kept so artificially cheap due to government subsidies and government buybacks that the poor and everyone else can afford to eat several times a day what are, in fact, very expensive things to produce. Today's consumers don't pay the true cost, economically speaking, of what it takes to produce massive quantities of animal-based meat, dairy, and eggs. And although some people celebrate this economic parity, it's proven to have dire consequences for the animals who are bred, for the humans who are overfed, and for the ecosystems that simply cannot withstand the unsustainable stress and strain. Meat and dairy production accounts for nearly 85% of the greenhouse gas emissions and 90% of the agricultural land use associated with the average American diet. About half of the emissions generated and land used is from beef alone. Over 9 billion land animals and 47 billion aquatic animals are killed for human consumption every year in the United States alone and 68 billion land animals worldwide every year. And today, the most preventable killers in industrialized countries are those that have been coined the diseases of affluence, like atherosclerosis, which comprises heart disease and strokes, cancer, and diabetes, all linked to the consumption of animal-based meat, dairy, and eggs. But because cheap animal products are available to everyone, these diseases of affluence afflict those with and those without wealth. They are diseases without prejudice or concern for class, race, or economic status. And it is not only class disparity that's apparent in the linguistic distinction we make and that Scott makes in Ivanhoe between the living animals we feed and the slaughtered animals on whom we feed. Also at play is a psychological dichotomy, a cognitive dissonance that enables us to distance ourselves from and become desensitized to the once living animals who are reduced to lifeless bits and pieces on our plates. A growing body of research examining the psychology of eating animals illustrates the many factors at play when we eat meat and call it such. So total meat intake in the United States averages 128 grams per day, more than three times the global average. Humans eat quantities of animal meat unprecedented in human history. And yet we clearly care about the welfare and well-being of non-human animals. According to the American Pet Products Association, there are more than 300 million companion animals in U.S. homes on whom it is estimated we spent $62.75 billion in 2016. 
But it's not just companion animals, cats and dogs and rabbits, fish and birds we care about. Americans consistently call for protection for farmed animals as well. A 2016 survey funded by the ASPCA found that more than three out of four, 77 percent consumers, say that they are concerned about the welfare of animals raised for human consumption. And according to a national poll from 2015, 86 percent of meat eating Americans say it's important that farmed animals are treated humanely. Concern for the treatment of animals spans income level, party affiliation, sex, and race, and it's conveyed consistently in survey data going back several decades. Just a quick break to remind you that Animology is brought to you by you, the listeners of this podcast. Think of patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Gaudreau as a tip jar. If you appreciate what you hear in this podcast, you can show your appreciation by filling up the tip jar. Not only does your support make everything that goes into this podcast possible, the research, the writing, the preparation, the recording, the editing, the file hosting, the social media marketing... You also enjoy some perks, such as written transcripts to each and every episode, which is really helpful for a podcast about words. So show your appreciation by adding a tip to the jar at patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Gaudreau, or you can go straight to animologypodcast.com and click on the donate button where you'll see options to donate either monthly or make a one-time contribution. So how is it that we genuinely don't want to see animals suffer, and yet we bring billions of them into the world each year only to kill them. How do we reconcile our compassion for their living selves with our voracious appetite for their dismembered flesh? How can we feel one way and act from such a contradictory place? Well, psychologists studying this tension have coined it the meat paradox, the phenomenon whereby people, this is a quote, people care about animals and do not want to see them harmed, but engage in a diet that requires them to be killed and usually to suffer, unquote. As posited by the theory of cognitive dissonance, when faced with a conflict like this, when our actions don't reflect our ethics, we tend to take one of two roads. We either change our behavior to align with our beliefs, or we change our beliefs to align with our behavior. The first option is played out most apparently in the behavior of vegetarians and vegans who choose to stop eating the flesh of animals as well as their eggs and milk, respectively. The second is manifested in more subtle ways, such as by changing our perception of the animals themselves. And this is where language plays a huge role. Research has found that the way we perceive animals is intimately tied to our ability to eat their flesh. For instance, according to researchers on the psychology of meat consumption, quote, eating animals is morally troublesome when animals are perceived as worthy of moral concern. The more moral concern we afford an entity, the more immoral it becomes to harm it, end quote. Research psychologists have found That one way of resolving the tension between compassion for animals and consumption of them is to categorize living animals as food. The effect is a lessening of our ethical concern for them and a rationalizing of our consumption of them by linguistically cleaving animals into arbitrary categories, circus animals, pets, laboratory animals, wildlife, farm animals, food animals or food, we unconsciously create decisions about how we perceive and treat those within their respective categories. For instance, we may demand that a dog who lives with a family in a home deserves to be protected against pain and suffering. And indeed, it is illegal to hurt or kill a dog who lives in a home. But we accept that a dog in a laboratory can be put through the most agonizing procedures and be killed. The dog in the lab has the same capacity to suffer as the dog in the home. But our classification of one as a pet and the other as a laboratory animal or research subject, as they would be euphemistically called in the research industry, enables us to rationalize our use of one 
but not the other. Similarly, our treatment and slaughter of the animals bred and killed for human consumption would be illegal if applied toward those house cats and dogs. The ability to feel pain and the desire to avoid death is the same in all animals, but our subjective categorizations of them sanctions our exploitation of the cows or the pigs or the chickens or the turkeys and sanctions our protection of the cats or the dogs or even the horses. This cognitive dissonance is precisely what gives credence to our being outraged that cats, dogs, and horses are killed for consumption in certain countries around the world as we fail to recognize that there's no difference between cats, dogs, and horses and cows, pigs, and chickens in terms of their ability to feel pain and their desire to resist death. When we reduce animals to inanimate objects, food, we no longer see a living animal and can more effortlessly ease ourselves into cognitive dissonance. I discuss this in this context with Carol Adams in my interview with her called How Animals Disappear in Our Language. You can listen to that episode. And what better way to disassociate inanimate meat, quote, meat, from its animal origins than through language. When we say pork instead of pig, beef instead of cow, veal instead of calf. Now look, the social drivers that compel us to eat animals are manifold. And I'm not suggesting that simply calling the animal flesh we eat by the names of the living animals we kill would solve the problem. But certainly this lexical distinction contributes to our cognitive dissonance. After all, we don't have separate lexicons for the plant foods we eat. Growing in gardens or plucked from the ground, a potato is still a potato. There's no need to distinguish between the blossoming and the plucked apple. But what about the animals for whom we don't have separate words to distinguish between the living and the slaughtered? How do we reconcile the fact that many of us would be uneasy ordering cow steer, calf, bull, or ox from a menu, or to further that, cow burger, steer burger, calf burger, bull burger. But we are unfazed asking for a meal made from turkey, chicken, rabbit, fish. We have no problem saying I'll have the turkey breast, I'll have the turkey burger, I'll have the chicken a la carte. Not to mention bison, shark, or alligator, and the many other animals who appear on our menus by their living names. No doubt, cultural and personal conditioning plays a role. We're taught from a young age to use the word beef to refer to the flesh of cattle, pork to refer to the flesh of pigs, chicken to refer to the flesh of chickens, and sundry other derivatives based on which part of the animal's body is severed for example, ribs, shoulder, leg, rump, or how that body part is processed and prepared, for example, sausage, salami, pepperoni, or ham, the answer may also have something to do with the diet of the peasant class versus that of the ruling nobility in Norman England, which dictated which foreign words morphed into the general parlance of the English language, as we've already seen with beef, pork, veal, and poultry, and which stuck to their old English roots. The French-speaking Normans who invaded and ruled England used the words familiar to them in their own language to refer to the animal-based meats they ate. If the aristocracy didn't eat a particular animal, or if certain animals weren't present in Britain at the time, neither the living animals nor their flesh would have been given an Anglo-Norman name. Based on the frequency with which some words are used, it's likely the Anglo-Normans ate more beef, pork, and mutton than they did fish and chicken, the latter two being considered less prestigious because of their association with the peasant class, whose food was mandated to be less refined than that of the ruling classes. Sumptuary laws, laws made for the purpose of restraining luxury or extravagance, made sure the lower classes remembered their place 
in accordance with their social class. The belief in the resemblance between one's labor and one's food meant that manual labor, and thus the peasant classes, required coarser, cheaper food. Thus, the common folk ate Old English swine or pig or hog rather than the Norman French pork. Uh, The common folk ate Old English chicken rather than Norman French poultry. In fact, poultry as an English word doesn't even appear in regular use until the late 14th century. So just furthering this point, today we say rabbit to denote the living animal and their served up flesh as we do with chicken. But we don't, in fact, get our contemporary English word from the Anglo-Saxons. Native to Morocco and the Iberian Peninsula, rabbits weren't brought to England until after the Norman invasion. Thus, there was no Germanic or Celtic or subsequently Anglo-Saxon Old English word for them. The word rabbit is derived from the Anglo-Norman word rabot, And there is no English word to depict these domesticated animals until after the Normans bring rabbits to England for raising, killing, and eating. The earliest documented use of the word is 1398. Rarely consumed by the lower classes, rabot was indulged in by the nobility and the wealthy middle class who bred them. The Anglo-Saxons would have used the word hare, hara, to refer to a similar but wild animal whom they would have hunted for consumption. The Old English word hara is thought to be derived from the Proto-Indo-European word kas, meaning gray. Thus, like the Anglo-Norman word boeuf that English speakers adopted as beef, or the Anglo-Norman word pork that was barred into English as pork, the Anglo-Norman word rabbit was what English speakers adopted as rabbit to refer to the flesh of that slaughtered animal. But unlike the French borrowed words beef and pork, the word rabbit came also to denote the living animal. And so today we use the French-derived word rabbit for the living animal as well as for the flesh of the slaughtered animal. And continuing on this line, geese and ducks, these are some of the things people say when they order from a restaurant menu. There's not a separate word for geese and ducks. And the reason might be because geese and ducks had been domesticated, but were not as popular with the Anglo-Norman speaking nobility. Turkeys weren't brought to England from the New World until the 16th century, so the Anglo-Normans wouldn't have eaten or named them. And similarly, where we see bison, shark, or alligator on menus today, of course, these animals weren't farmed or eaten by the Anglo-Normans. So the diet of the medieval aristocracy offers a bit of a clue as to why the English speakers may not have adopted words from French to refer to some of the animals they ate, which may be why we still say chicken, rabbit, goose, and turkey when denoting both the living and slaughtered animals today. However, I would argue that over the hundreds of years we've been using these words to refer to the flesh of these animals, I'll have the chicken parmesan, I'll have the rabbit cassoulet, I'll have the turkey burger, we've stripped them of their once living sources. In other words, saying chicken to denote the flesh of that animal has become as removed from the living chicken as beef has from cow. I've tested this theory several times over the decades by making small semantic tweaks when asking animal meat eaters about their eating habits. And the responses are often always the same. When I ask if they eat chicken, they invariably say, yeah, I eat chicken. I love chicken. But when I ask them if they eat chickens, do you eat chickens? their face tends to contort into an expression of disgust as if seeing the living animal in their mind's eye for the first time and wincing at the idea. This works just as well if I change the question to, do you eat turkey? Oh, yeah, I eat turkey. But when I ask, do you eat turkeys? I watch as their brain transforms a plate of mayonnaise-covered sandwich slices into a squawking feathered bird. Do you eat duck? Yes, Do you eat ducks? No. Do you eat rabbit? Yeah. Do you eat rabbits? No. Do you eat lamb? 
Well, frankly, most people say no, because they do associate the word lamb with the living babies. And notice how we don't have a plural for lamb other than lamb. On a separate episode, I discuss what are called zero plurals, where the noun for the singular and the plural remains the same, such as deer or bison or lamb. We don't say deers, bisons, or lambs. There's a theory that this is a linguistic category unto itself, reflecting, this is interesting, an Anglo-Saxon cultural category of animals who are commonly killed, hunted, fished, or shot. We'll come back to that idea. The point is this, by making just a slight change to words that have for so long denoted only flesh, only meat, by making a slight change from chicken to chickens, from duck to ducks, from turkey to turkeys, from goose to geese, it's as if the living animals are reanimated for the first time and the cognitive dissonance is swept away. Just a small change puts the animals back into our language and our thoughts, talking about them not as dismembered body parts, but as the living, feeling, breathing, thinking beings they are. Language is not simply a means of communication. It represents and reinforces the attitudes of our culture. It informs and gives social credit to our thoughts and actions. And it masks, justifies, or dulls our ethical red flags. By making conscious choices about how we talk about animals, we may find that we're more inclined to make more conscious choices in terms of our regard for and treatment of them. For the animals, this is Colleen patrick Adreau. Thanks for listening to Animology, changing the way we talk and think about other animals. <laughs>